The Bible says that we are partakers of the divine nature. That means that we are participators in the divine nature. We are participating in the divine experience. Meaning that God has brought us into a realm of life where we can function like Him. You see, that's exactly what He wants. Hallelujah. There are three major dimensions to man's function. In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 and verse 23 Paul says and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly that means sanctify you completely and I pray God your entire King James uses the word whole your entire spirit and soul and body be preserved faultless. Be kept faultless, blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, I pray to God that your entire spirit, soul, and body. Be kept in perfection until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is your entire, your whole spirit, soul, and body. So we know that man functions in these three dimensions. In Hebrews, the fourth chapter and the twelfth verse, let's look at it. Book of Hebrews, fourth chapter, and the twelfth verse. For the logos of God, the word of God, is quick and powerful. And I've says living and active. It says the word of God is living and active. I like that. Hallelujah. It's living and active. King James is quick and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And of the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the hearts. I'd like to read it to you from the Amplified Translation. It says, for the word that God speaks is alive and full of power. Making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. Aren't you like that? The word of God is full of power. Making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. Oh, hallelujah. So when I study the word of God, it is active in me. It is operative in me. It is energizing in me, hallelujah, and effective in my life. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, soul, and immortal spirit, and of joints and marrow. Says of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. I kind of like that. Another creature exists that is concealed from his sight. The word of God sees everything. He says, but all things are open and exposed, naked and defenseless to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. Think about it. He says, everything, everything in life, 
every creature, everything that exists is open and exposed, naked and defenseless to the Word of God. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. The man functions in these three major dimensions his spirit, his soul, and his body. In the teachings of the Apostle Paul and the, the Apostle Peter, they help us understand that there is an outward man and there is an inward man. The outward man is the body and his senses. The five senses of the body. And the inward man is the spirit and his soul. And when you understand that, you begin to see why we can relate. We relate with God through our spirits. So, with our spirit, we relate to the spirit world, okay? The spirit realm. And uh, we have our soul with which we relate intellectually and then we have our bodies with which you relate with the physical world if you don't have a body you cannot relate with the physical world are you getting the idea okay with our physical bodies we relate with the physical world if you don't have a body you cannot function in the earth Need, you need to have a body to function in the world. Demon spirits. Now, I want you to understand there's a difference between demon spirits and fallen angels. Now, some people don't understand that there is a difference. But I want to explain to you that there is a difference. You have demon spirits. You have fallen angels. But they are all falling anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. Who and what are demon spirits? And uh, who and what are fallen angels? Fallen angels are... Uh, the angelic beings like Satan and a host of other beings like that who were dethroned. Satan and his angels who were dethroned. And they function in the world. But they do not possess human bodies like the demons do. They take over human bodies through their words. Satan does not possess people. He only possesses them through his word. Okay? For example, you remember when Jesus, the Bible says he turned to Peter. And he said, get thee here in Satan, for thou severest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. He turned to Peter. Meaning Satan was in Peter. But was Peter possessed by Satan? No. What happened was, Satan sowed the seed of his word into Peter's mind. 
And Peter began to say to Jesus, the Bible says, Peter took Jesus aside. Peter. He took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> he told Jesus, don't say you're going to die again. Don't say it. You're not going to die. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, get thee here, Satan. How did Satan get into Peter? Through his word. But the personality of Satan was not in Peter. Are you getting this? How does God get into us? Through his word. Now, but then he also seeks to possess us through the Holy Spirit. Jesus does not come into us. Jesus does not live in us like we say, Jesus is in me. That is a nice statement. That is a spiritual statement. But you see, it doesn't really have what you call spiritual sense. It's not the reality. Okay? Now, the reality of it is, it's his words that's in you. Jesus has a body. He has a body of his own. And so cannot live in you with his body. He has his own body. He's not like the Holy Spirit in that function. He has a body of his own. So, he has a physical body. And so, he does not live in us that way. He lives in us through his word. He puts his word in us. We accept his word. We think his word. We meditate on his word. We act on his word. And so his word carries his nature. The word of God is the seed of God. That means the life principle of God. So when you have his word, you have his life. Hallelujah. But then, the Holy Spirit doesn't use a physical body. And so for the Holy Spirit to function at his best in the earth, he needs a physical body. That's why he tabernacled in the body of Jesus. And the one in whom the Holy Spirit lives without measure, that is the Christ. And that's the blessing that he brought to us. So the Holy Spirit could live in us without measure. In the Old Testament, he, he anointed the prophets with his presence. It, it was called a rub off of the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's where the word anointing came from. Because it's oil. It means the smearing of oil. That's the word anointing. To be anointed meant to be smeared with oil. Now to be anointed with the Holy Spirit meant to be smeared with the presence of the Holy Spirit. But in the New Testament, you don't find that expression consistently used the way they did in the Old Testament. Except for purposes. Okay? Rather you have the anointed one. And this anointed one is the Messiah. Whom they were looking forward to. They knew the kings were anointed. They knew the prophets were anointed. They knew the priests were anointed. But they were looking forward to the anointed one. The one that had the spirit without measure. The one that was not just having the anointing smeared on him. The presence smeared on him. They are talking about the one in whom the Holy Spirit dwelt in totality. That's the Messiah. That's Jesus. And Jesus made that possible for us. So in each one of us now, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell. Oh, that's why he said, I'm going to the Father. He said to the disciples, I'm going to the Father. And when I get there, he said, I'll pray the Father. And he shall give you another comforter. Talking about the Holy Spirit. He said, and when he comes, he shall abide with you forever. He shall dwell in you. He shall teach you all things. He shall take of mine and show it to you. He will show you the future. So many blessings of the Holy Spirit. 
But Papa God is always on the throne. But the Holy Spirit takes his presence everywhere. The Holy Spirit takes the presence of Jesus everywhere. Now you can understand this when you look at the other side. The devil's side now. I told you Satan doesn't possess people like that. Because Satan also has what you call a celestial body. He has a spiritual body. And he was not bereaved of his spiritual body. You see, his spiritual body was not taken from him. And that's why Satan is still beautiful. Still takes several different forms. Still shows himself in all kinds of beauty. But his eyes to know Satan, if he ever appears to you, is his eyes. He can appear in the form of a human person, like a man. He can appear like a woman. He can take up any form. He can show up in the street. You say, does he? Oh yes, emphatically yes, he does. He can show up like a normal person that you know. And walk into your home. And walk into your office. Not only Satan, his angels do the same. And the Bible tells us about them. And you think you're seeing somebody that you know. And so how do you know him? Oh, you will not, you, you can't miss him. If you're spiritually minded, you can't miss him. His eyes are terribly evil. No matter what forms he takes, you can't miss him. You could find him at the hospital ward, and he has helped some people deliver babies. And done some terrible things. And put devils in them. He's turned into a, a young lady and, and some young fellow, a man, married her. Only got him to find he had the devil. Now somebody says, ah, I know that my wife, ka, ka, ka. <laughs> I think pastor is just describing my wife. <laughs> I am not describing your wife. You are just looking for trouble. <laughs> Hallelujah. But Satan does those things. See, the Bible says, no wonder that Satan and his angels are also going around as ministers of light. If you study in the book of Hebrews, the 13th chapter, the Bible tells us not to be negligent to entertain strangers for some have entertained angels unawares now those are angels of god how can you entertain an angel unawares because the angel will come with normal causing like another human being just like anybody else now don't get this idea that whenever angels show up they got those wings on their backs make no mistakes about it that's not the way they do Look back in the Old Testament. They appeared in human forms like normal everyday fellows. That's the way they showed up. On few occasions, they showed up in their glory. They don't always do that. You see, we have to understand that there's a realm of the spirit that is present with us now now when you are born again you're actually born into that realm but if you're not trained in the things of the spirit you will live over on the other side and never be aware of the real realm to which you're born those who function according to the senses are ignorant of the spirit realm They're ignorant of it. So they don't understand the things that happen to them. And that's one of the reasons for our study of the subject.
Because all you see is not all there is. I know that there are those who go to the extreme and they think that whenever they have a problem, it's the devil, there's a demon. Um, I mean, if they don't get a taxi early, it's the devil that's stopping the taxi from coming. You know, just all kinds of things. You wake up late, it's the devil of sleeping that stops you from waking up. Uh, uh, um, you know? So they, like, they believe that demons are everywhere about them. What about the angels? It's better for us to be angel conscious than devil conscious. There are more angels than demons. Hallelujah. But we need to know about this realm of life. And the Bible is replete with information on the realm of the Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'd like you to turn into St. John's Gospel, the, four, the fifth chapter. And uh, we will read from the 24th verse. St. John chapter 5. And verse 24. He says, Verily, verily, Jesus is talking. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life. That's the way. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Now, this is, this is very, very remarkable. He says, Anybody who hears my word and believes on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Didn't say shall have, but hath everlasting life. And then he says, and shall not come into condemnation. The same word means judgment. Shall not come into judgment. Hallelujah. Why? Because Jesus was already judged for that man. Okay? So because we accepted the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. He offered himself. So what? He shall not come into condemnation. But then he says, but he's past. He's past. Didn't say shall pass. He's past. The Greek word for past there is metabino. Meaning to be removed from one place and transferred to another place. So it means we have been removed. He says he's past from death unto life. Meaning that these two realms are existing in the now. Because everybody doesn't believe at the same time. And when you believe, you are past metabino, you are removed from death unto life. Now there are two of you born of the same mother. One has given his heart to Jesus Christ and is passed from death unto life. He lives in the same house with the other guy who is his brother, same parents, who has not believed. He is not passed from death unto life. He is still in the realm of death. And the other one is in the realm of life. They live under the same roof, but they live in two different realms. One lives in the realm of death. One lives in the realm of life. One is a child of the devil. One is a child of God. To be a child of God, you have to be born again. You see that? The reason of being born again. Now understand, the terminology being born again was not invented by a certain group of Christians. Some denomination uh, or some they call, they call protestants. No. Being born again is not a term invented by protestants or Pentecostals or charismatics or whatever they may be called. The very term was used by Jesus. It's not our interpretation of what he said. It is the very expression of what he said. St. John's Gospel chapter 3. Let's look at it. Are you there? I'm reading from verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. He came by night because he didn't want people to see him. Same came Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, 
we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? You see, the expression came from Jesus. And when he made that expression, the man to whom he spoke didn't understand. He said, how can a man that is old be born? He's already old, how can he be born? Look at Jesus replied to him. You there? Verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Hallelujah. And now just before anybody gets confused about that, when it says about being born of water, so it says, well, that's a, a water baptism. That's not water baptism. I got a tape on that, but I wouldn't want to digress. Okay. Now, look at this. When a man is born again, the Bible says he is passed. He is removed. Okay? He is transferred from the domain of darkness, from the domain, the realm of death, into life. It happens instantly. It's not something that's going to happen in the sweet by and by. It happens now. You're born again today, you're transferred today from the realm of death into the realm of life. The first epistle of St. John, chapter 3. Let's look at the same expression. I'm reading to you from verse 14. We know, have you seen it? Verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life. Hallelujah. We know. Somebody said, we know. We know. See, it's already happened. See, those of us who are born again, we know. We know that we have, we have passed from death unto life. It's the same word, metabino. We have passed. We have been transferred, removed from death unto life. Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abided in death. He remains there. Why? Because of the love that Jesus brought. It's a different kind of love. Hallelujah. When you're passed from death. Death is the realm of darkness. Death is the realm of selfishness. When you're passed from death unto life. Oh, glory to God. You have a new kind of thinking. Because you live in the realm of life. And in the realm of life, there is no shortage. You see why you can't be selfish? Why you always be a giver? Because in the realm of life, there is no shortage. In the realm of life, there is no lack. In the realm of life, there is no poverty. You cannot not have. You see, this is another realm. But you see, a lot of folks don't understand it. They've been born in there, but they are living another life. See, they have the way they want God. Somebody told a story about a, a man who was, who was falling. And uh, as he was falling off the cliff, he held onto a branch, something that was almost breaking. And he cried out, is anybody out there? Somebody help me. Anybody there? And then he heard a voice. The voice said, I'm here. He said, who are you? And he's still holding it because he's about to fall. Who are you? He said, I'm God. He said, okay, God help me. God said, all right, I'll help you. Let's go. 
He said, let go. He said, is there anybody else there? See, he thought that guy must be stupid. Let go. <laughs> but God wants to help. He said, let go. Torah dos kipra handola hashtel. If you could only see from God's point of view. We've been so dominated by the senses because, see, we, we, we think all that we can perceive with our senses is all there is. And the principles of this world just don't measure up with the principles of the kingdom of God to which we belong. We know that we have passed from death unto life. <laughs> I love this. This is John. He says, we know, I do. We are aware. John was aware. Are you aware? John was aware. He says, we know that we have passed. We are not passing. We have passed from the realm of death into the realm of life. He says, can't you see we got the new kind of love? Love that gives. Love that helps. Love that thinks of others before yourself. The all-conquering love. It says we know that we have passed from dead unto life. Because we love the brethren. The natural man doesn't have that kind of love. He doesn't have it. He doesn't have it. Make no mistakes about it. Just because you're a husband or you're a wife doesn't mean you got it. You don't have it. You got to be born again to have it. We know that we have passed from death unto life. We now are in the realm of life. There is a realm of death. It's on now. There are people there now. And there is a realm of life. In the realm of life, it's success only. You know, I know there are people who say, you know, sometimes there's life up and life down. They say, um, up in the mountain sometimes, down in the valley sometimes. There's good times and there's bad times. Well, I don't know about that. Because I live over on this other side. See? And where I am, everything is good. Hallelujah. Everything is good. That's where I live. It's not the experience of many people. But why are they experiencing it that way? Because they have not accepted the truth. They haven't accepted it. They preach to their own minds. They've told themselves that life cannot be always good. Well, that's what you said. That's what you have. Somebody cannot always, some, some people say that everybody is sick one way or another. Where did you get it from? You see, your mentality, your mindset, your phronesis. That is where the problem is. He has a mindset. He has come to believe that everybody has some five minutes madness every day. I don't have any madness. You know, people have those kind of thoughts. They say that everybody has a five minutes madness. They just talk as though they know something. It's their, it's their way. That's just them. It's their, <laughs> they are phronesis based on the sunesis that they got from reading newspapers and all the wrong stuff. What kind of a life is that? They say everything cannot just be good. Huh? The Bible says he accords to inherit a blessing. It says, blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in. Everything you put your hands upon shall be blessed. Blessed. He said he shows a difference between the Jews and the Egyptians. And that was just a type. 
If you, listen, run your business with the furnaces of God. And you, you'd be at another level. Live from the high level, from the mountain top. Are you still there? Live up there. Refuse to come down. They always want to bring us down to the level of humanity. They say, we are all humans. But that's why Jesus came. To make these human beings to become partakers of the divine nature. And some want to drag us back and say, remember you are human. Come on, remember. Remember you are human. There is, okay, I am human. The moment you say, you know, we are all human, your spirit, your faith just go. Whew. I'm a human being now. Huh? Don't talk like that. Stop talking like that. Say, are we no longer human beings? Let me ask you a question. How did you know you were a human being? No, tell me. Somebody told you. You heard from somewhere. Adam, where art thou? Adam's hiding from God. He says, Eve, come, come, come. They're hiding from God. Adam, where art thou? And God is pretending he doesn't know where Adam is. Adam, where art thou? He said, I'm here. Why are you hiding? I heard your voice and I hid myself because I'm naked. God said, who told you? Who told you? Who told you you're naked? Who told you? How did you know? Father, I'm just a naked missing me. I'm, I'm, I'm just... God does not change because of your crying. If you like, keep crying. I have a message I preached some years ago. The title is Try Tears. When you listen, you will cry. It's for hardened people. They need to cry a bit. But if you're not hardened, and you have come to that point where God said, I'll take you with the stony heart. And put a heart of flesh. You don't have any problems. <laughs> I've suffered so much. Oh God, do something. He won't do anything. Your suffering has only just started. Until you stop praying like that. You say, Father, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> You may be experiencing some terrible things, maybe in your family, and it's like one trouble after another, one trouble after another. God, you say, oh God, mercy for me now. He doesn't act like that. You know, you think that you're going to get God to become sorry for you. Maybe after he sees your suffering, he will just say, oh, listen, do you know how many people are languishing under the bridge? Does God not see them? Every day. Do you know how many people die in Iraq? Does God not see them? Go to the hospitals. Just wait at the door. After every few minutes, you will hear a cry. Someone has died. You think God does not see them? No, stay there. You think your trouble is the world. <laughs> Nothing will happen. Your situation will be worse. If the swelling was like this before, it would become like this. Let me tell you why is it that all those sufferings are going on. And God is as though he, he's not doing anything. He has already done something. That's why he sent us to preach the gospel. So that when men hear the gospel, listen, you know what Paul said? Paul was defending himself before the council. He said, I lived in all good conscience. This was before he was, he was born again. He said he lived in good conscience with the law. How could he have lived in a good conscience? 
when he was persecuting Christians and hauling them into prison. The Bible says he made havoc of the church. Yet, Paul said at that time, he lived in good conscience. His conscience, what's the conscience? The conscience is the voice of the human spirit. His conscience allowed him to do evil. And he called it good. His conscience was okay. There are many who are slaughtering others. Their conscience is alright. The conscience allows them to do it. Why? Because their spirit is not recreated. They don't have the life of God. It doesn't matter who dies. So long as they have their way, they're fighting for diamonds. They're fighting for gold. They're fighting for land. It doesn't matter who dies. Hardened people. Even the judge that sits down on the bench to sentence somebody he is not convinced has committed the crime. But because these two lawyers, one has defeated the other, condemned to death. His heart is not sure that the man committed the crime. Hardened people. Why is God not doing anything? Because he's already done it. So he's sending us to preach the gospel. That's why we're on television. That's why we're on the internet. That's why we're on satellites. That's why we're writing books and sending out tapes. That's why. So that men can get a hold of the world and have their hearts changed. And they begin to make new laws. Laws that are favorable to human beings. The present laws are hurtful to men. How can you destroy houses because they don't beautify the streets and you don't give them new homes to stay? What kind of a government is that? Hardened people. Wickedness. But when we preach the gospel and people believe, they wouldn't make such laws. They wouldn't make such decrees. They wouldn't make people homeless. They'll have a new kind of thinking. So God is waiting for us. So it's not God who is not doing something. He's already done something. The Bible says out of their ignorance they are suffering. Not because God didn't do anything. Why are so many in the hospitals when at the sound of the word everybody could check out of that hospital well? But will they believe? The Son of God came. The Bible says He was in the world. The world was made by Him. But the world recognized Him not. He came unto His own. His own received Him not. But as many as received Him. To them He gave power, the ability, the authority to become the sons of God. It was only those who received him. Others called him a sinner. They condemned him and killed him. But he was the son of God. He was the creator of the whole earth. Maker of heaven and earth. But they killed him. So it's not God who is not doing something about man's situation. Salvation is for everybody. Jesus died for everybody. He bought the whole field. The Bible says the field is the world. He's paid for everybody. No one should continue in sickness. No one should continue suffering. No one should die that kind of death. No one. Everyone has a right to life. Everyone has a right to happiness. Everyone has a right to fulfillment. Everybody has a right to peace. But why don't they have it? Because selfish men and women are dominating the scene. They rule the world. Hallelujah. Look at those who are selling fake drugs. And many are dying because they're expecting the drugs to kill them. And nothing is happening. And they're dying. Somebody did it. And we say, oh God, oh God, oh God, my son is dead. Oh God, oh, where are you? It's not God. You bought the fake drugs. You bought the fake drugs. Why? Maybe when you should have done something, you didn't. You read it on newspaper. All you did was to shake your head. Ah, why are people so wicked now? And that's all you did. But that's not all you should do. They say evil prevails when good men do nothing. Let's go back to the subject. Because I have many things to tell you. But that's another day. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. So God's not the problem. 
He's done everything he ever needed to do. Can you imagine if you preach the gospel to anybody? You'll be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. You'll be transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. Right away. And then from there, he starts learning. Learning the things of God. Growing in the life of God. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. I want to show you something about these two realms of life. First, I want us to see the fact that there's a spirit world. And there is a, a physical world. And these two worlds are on now. And we've got to function in both of them. And whether or not you know it, you're functioning in both of them. Second Kings. Second Kings. We're looking at chapter 6. Have you found it? I'm reading to you from verse 15. Now, here, let me give you the background. It's talking about Elisha, the man of God. And Elisha was a prophet of God and he had a servant who was working with him. And uh, the, the Syrians had been setting traps for the king of Israel. And they tried many times, but every time they tried... Elisha had a revelation and he told the king of Israel what his enemies were planning for him. And so whenever they went out, the Syrians found out that the king of Israel took some other route. And the king of Syria was wondering, who is betraying us? Who in our army here goes to reveal our secrets to the king of Israel? And somebody said to him, listen, there's a man of God in Israel. His name is Elisha. He said, that man tells the king of Israel what you discuss in your bedroom. <laughs> then he said, all right. He got soldiers, chariots and horses. He said, go and get that man. Where is he? He's in a little town. Dothan. So go and arrest him, he said. So, here's what we're reading now, from verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, he woke up early in the morning, and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And the servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? In other words, we're surrounded. What are we going to do? Verse 16. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Elisha had become spiritually minded. Elisha knew there was another realm of life. Elisha knew that there was a spirit realm that was greater than this earth realm. The servant of the man of God saw the horses, the chariots, the soldiers. He became afraid. Alas, master, what are we going to do? He said, fear not. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. Fear not. Let's look at it. Somebody say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. From verse 16 again, and he answered, fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed. And said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes. Listen, he didn't say, open my eyes. Elisha prayed, open his eyes. <laughs> what confidence Elisha had. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes. That he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire 
round about Elisha. Elisha knew. Do you think that Elisha was more protected than we are? Make no mistakes about it. Elisha knew. Fear deactivates the army of God. When you become afraid, they do nothing. Because they wait for your word. Oh, you've got to understand it. Do, hey, hey, hey. Uh, uh, uh. You getting it? Hello? Ligoro Ansku Fractila Hastis? Vila Makizo Fractustala Akto. Hebrews chapter 1. Let me show you something. Can I tell you what I said in other tongues? I'll tell you. Hebrews chapter 1. I said in the spirit, I said, do you want me to show you something? That's what I asked you. Then I said, when you see this, if you can act on it and believe it, your life will never be the same again. Yeah. Hallelujah. Okay, now look at it. In verse, let me read it to you from verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? He's talking about angels of God, all right? Then he says, are they not all, I want you to notice something. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Now notice, he didn't say sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. Look at your back. He says, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Now, why is it for them rather than to them? Sent forth to minister to them means God sent them to these believers to minister to them. Give them a message. Help them out about something. Maybe give them this or do that for them and so on. But he said, sent forth to minister for them, meaning they come to serve, waiting to be instructed. You see the difference? So we got angels all around us. Now there are different kinds of angels. Many years ago, I read a book, um, I've forgotten the man's name now, he wrote some things about angels, and he was in a conversation with an angel, and uh, the angel said, we only take instructions from God, we don't take instructions from people, or from anybody, only from God. Well, um, the guy then wrote in his book that angels don't take instructions from people. Well, he based his teaching on an experience, which he didn't have full understanding of. Now you have to understand there are different kinds of angels. There are different levels of angels. I do not give instruction to your angels. There are angels of God that minister to God and there are angels of God that minister for God. But there are angels that he sent to be with us. Oh, come on here. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples? He said, don't you underestimate any of these little ones. He said, their angels see the face of my father regularly. What happens? They report to heaven. They give their reports on the children. Now, when you grow up, the angel doesn't leave you. The angel continues with you. Now, if you keep doing the things of God and keep obeying God from one phase to another and He promotes you, your angel is also promoted along with you. And more angels are sent under Him. Are you following this? Now, this is very, very important. Very, very important. So, there are angels that are sent 
to minister for us. What do you do? Your angels have been there, just waiting. You're suffering in their presence. They look. They could have done something, but you didn't say anything. So, in their presence, you're crying. Ah! Hey, you say, how can that be in the presence? Look at Jesus. He calls, and Peter comes out of the boat to walk on the water to go to Jesus. When Peter looked at the waves, the Bible says fear gripped him. He began to sink in the presence of Jesus. So the Bible, why didn't Jesus say, why didn't you look at him like this? Right in my presence? You are joking. <laughs> he could have done that. He could have just been looking at him. Sinking? I'll just bring you out? No. The Bible says, Jesus, immediately, quickly, that's what the Bible says, quickly got a hold of Peter and said, why did you doubt? Peter would have died in the presence of Jesus. So he got him quickly. So there's things that happen. Kenneth Hagin tells a story. A beautiful story. He says that Jesus appeared to him one time. And, uh, and while Jesus was talking to him, a demon spirit came and stood between he and Jesus. And Jesus kept talking to him. But he was writing some of the things that Jesus was telling him. And the demon stood in there and was making a noise. Yakety yak, yakety yak, yakety yak, yakety yak. <laughs> and Jesus just kept on talking. And he said he was wondering, doesn't Jesus know that I can't hear him anymore? Isn't he going to do something about this demon? But Jesus kept talking and he was losing the information. Finally, he got aggravated with the situation and rebuked the devil and said, Get out in Jesus' name. The demon fell down and tucked his tail between his legs and ran off. He looked like a little monkey, he said. And that demon ran off. Then Jesus said, If you hadn't done something about it, I couldn't have done anything. So he, he, he said, huh? What did you say? Because he was a man who was careful about words. He thought, I heard you, Jesus. You didn't say, If I didn't do something, you couldn't have done anything. I, did you mean you wouldn't have done anything? Jesus said, I couldn't have done anything. You couldn't? He said, you can't say that. You couldn't? Jesus said, I said, if you hadn't done anything, I couldn't have done anything about the situation. He said, Lord, why? He said, you see, when I came out of the grave, and I got all authority from heaven, in heaven and in earth, he said, I gave the authority to the church. He said, the authority over demons is with you. So if you hadn't done anything about that demon, I couldn't have done anything because I've given you the authority. Ooh. And Kenneth Hagin said, that changed his life. Harold Roberts tells a story. He had been in the hospital. While he was there, Jesus appeared and talked to him. And there was another man standing by, huge, tall fellow. And he asked Jesus, he said, and who is that? Jesus said, that's your angel. And after Jesus had talked to him, Jesus left. The angel was waiting. The angel said, dispatch me. He said, I'm waiting. Why? There's something he had asked the Lord for concerning the city of faith, the then city of faith. And the angel was waiting to go get it done. He said, dispatch me. And he said, in the name of Jesus, I dispatch you. <laughs> Glory to God. You don't have to wait to see the angel first. The Bible already said they are there. Are you still there? 
Many years ago, two angels came to me. And there's a big one, tall, huge fellow. He said, come, I want to show you how to heal the sick. I didn't know who he was. I knew he was an angel, just didn't know which one. Well, that's the angel that goes with me healing the sick. And then I was following him through the aisle of that building that looked like a church building, some kind of a church building. And he was showing how to heal the sick. And there was another one behind him who wasn't saying anything. What was he doing? Carrying out his ministry. You see, we have to understand there's a real realm of the spirit. It exists and it is here now. And we are part of it because we're born into it. Every one of you has an angel. At least one. There's many of them that go with me now. The many. Oh, it's true. Very true. There's some of them who are just stationed in this place. Some are just here. That's a fact. Very important fact. They do a lot of things. They bless people. They bless people. 